One of the newest members of the Soil Science Department, uh, Dr. Joanne. Anyways, Joanne joined the department uh, as an assistant professor this August, but many of us have worked with Joanne for years. She's completed her PhD in the same department. Uh, her interests uh, involve nutrient flows and agroecosystems, especially phosphorus. And um, she's worked extensively in research, extension, and education regard regarding uh, organic and ecological farming systems in the past year. Uh, so we're delighted to have her on staff and to uh, tell us about some of the research you've been involved in the last few years in regards to struvite. Welcome, Joanne. Help me welcome Joanne this morning. Thanks so much, John. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I see the ranks are maybe a little thin this morning. I'm going to assume that's because of the roads and not because people don't care about phosphorus, because it's the most important nutrient, right? <laughs> Woohoo! Okay, so I want to talk today a little bit about uh, struvite fertilizer. This is uh, available in Canada as the product Crystal Green, sold by Ostera. There are other formula formulations of struvite out there, not here though, but I'm um, going to talk kind of generally about struvite as well as that product in particular a little bit in, in a research, research context. But going to start with a little bit about phosphorus in general, phosphorus cycling, and then go through what struvite is, some of the research around it. So phosphorus... Uh, is challenging to manage in agriculture, and I think we kind of use our sort of blanket um, management approaches because you know we don't necessarily see that big response year to year in our you know application rates and whatever. But we do have a phosphorus problem in agriculture and society, in that we rely really heavily on mined phosphate rock deposits uh, to create our fertilizers to support our uh, crop um, production. Uh, systems and eventually our human uh, food supply. And as you can see in this diagram of the phosphorus flows in the environment, at every step of that process there are losses to the environment. And in some cases they're large, in some cases they're not that large, but the problem with it is it doesn't take much of a loss to cause a huge environmental problem. It's tiny amounts of phosphorus lost that create these uh, this eutrophication, algal blooms in our aquatic ecosystems. So um, that, plus the fact that phosphorus is a non-renewable resource, and um, you know we really have to find ways to help recycle that phosphorus back from uh, all those different waste streams uh, to our agricultural land. And from our human waste is uh, a key area that is only now really being addressed um, with some vigor, I'll say. So one of the most promising ways of recycling human um, waste nutrients back to agricultural land is through extraction of struvite from municipal wastewater. So what is struvite? It is um, a naturally occurring compound. It's a magnesium ammonium phosphate hexahydrate, a crystal, and it actually forms, um, I'm gonna try to use this little laser pointer thingy. It actually forms spontaneously in the pipes of wastewater treatment plants when you have those high nutrient concentrations in the, in the liquid with the correct pH. So that's actually part of the impetus for some of these uh, wastewater treatment plants wanting to get rid of this stuff at some other stage of the treatment process rather than having it build up in pipes like you can see here on the left. So Saskatoon is doing this, Edmonton's doing this, other cities around the world are doing this. Winnipeg is not doing this at the moment. Um, the great thing about struvite extraction compared to some of the other for, um, phosphorus removal um, technologies is that it does yield a product that is useful as a fertilizer. And that's what Ostera is selling as the fertilizer crystal green. It's got a 52080 NPK analysis plus 10% uh, magnesium. And it comes in this uh, sort of granular sort of formulation, easy to use. Now, although that is sort of a newish technology here, struvite and these other kind of similar compounds are not new. Um, back in 1962, uh, Bridger et al. Um, wrote this, published this article on uh, the metal ammonium phosphates as fertilizers, and they found, uh, including magnesium ammonium phosphate, which is struvite. 
and um, found some, you know, there's some nice little gems in there that sort of foreshadow some of the, the research that was happening later. They say, you know, these um, products, because of their low solubility, will not cause salt injury to seeds and plants. They also note that the rate of availability can be controlled by granulation. So they're recommending, you know, this is kind of a horticultural application, they're recommending for a short duration crop like radishes you would use pulverized struvite, and for trees you would use large granules. So some of those, um, these ideas that we're seeing come out in the research now that I'm gonna talk about in a minute have actually been known for decades, but uh, we're only now really refining those ideas. Let's go slide. Not wanting to move. There we go. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the published research so far from the literature. Um, it's a growing body of literature, but it's not that big yet. Uh, what people have been finding though, when they do like the typical fertilizer characterizations, you know, solubility in water and citric acid, is that the struvite is quite poorly soluble in water, um, less than 5%. Um, and that gives it that sort of slow release um, property that people uh, like to talk about. It is highly soluble in acids though, like in the, the citric acid. Despite that slow solubility, the crop response to this stuff actually seems to be pretty good. Often in studies, um, you know, comparing side by side to a soluble fertilizer, we'll find that the struvite will perform equally well to a soluble fertilizer or maybe some a little less. Um, but there's all sorts of factors that come into play. So this is kind of just, you know, very broad, broad terms overall. But in individual studies, there's a lot of factors that get identified as being important for um, how these um, struvite fertilizers perform. Soil pH is a big one. The particle size of the struvite is another big one, as they already knew back in the 60s. And interestingly, there's an interaction there where in acidic soil conditions, the particle size doesn't matter so much. In alkaline, um, high pH soils, uh, the larger granules are they're, they just dissolve more slowly, and so crop uh, response can be significantly reduced in uh, those kind of high pH conditions with granular struvite. Crop type seems to make a difference. Um, different crops seem to respond differently than they would to a soluble fertilizer. And then there's just little bits of, of research on things like um, temperature regimes, soil texture, other properties, but um, just sort of starting to get into it a little bit. Um, all of this research is great. I'm not dissing any of this research, but there are still huge research gaps um, in um, struvite, you know, the agronomic potential uh, and how to optimize it. Most of the studies published so far have used powdered struvite. Um, very few are using clay soils, and there's all kinds of phosphorus, um, you know, retention processes that we have to think about in the clay soils. Uh, there's very few field studies so far, and there's very, very little attention to management. It's more or less a, like, will it provide a crop response in a pot in a greenhouse, um, and how does that compare to a soluble fertilizer? Not like, how are we going to place it, time the application, and what are the appropriate rates for this particular phosphorus source? So, those are a few pieces of the puzzle that we have. Um, on, on that big picture of how struvite works. And um, we're still missing a lot of pieces, but I'll just go over a few of the little pieces that we have as we start to sort of flesh out this whole bigger picture. Uh, I'm gonna go through some of the research that's been done here in Manitoba first. So this is some work that was done by Francis Zamoya's lab here at the University of Manitoba. They were actually working with struvite that was extracted from hog manure, not from uh, municipal wastewater. So it's a, it was a different product produced in their own lab and did a study in the greenhouse and uh, looked at crop sequences to try to get at what is this slow release pattern of this stuff. And so did wheat canola sequences in the greenhouse though, but growing those crops on the same pots uh, repeatedly. And what they found here in this graph, um, so you've got the crop phases, you know, one, two, three, across the bottom and uh, canola biomass yield. Black bars are struvite, white bars are MAP. We're gonna ignore those gray bars for the moment. But you can see in that first um, 
crop phase, uh, struvite and MAP produced a similar canola yield. But in those second and third phases, uh, the struvite uh, actually produced a greater amount of biomass than, than the MAP. So it does, there is, you know, a little um, bit of support for that idea that struvite can provide a longer term supply of phosphorus compared to a soluble fertilizer. The same group did a little uh, seedling toxicity study with canola, and they found that uh, struvite was a lot better for the uh, canola seedlings than a soluble fertilizer like MAP. So that's um, promising for those who want to put the phosphorus down with their canola seed. Um, now we'll get into uh, some field research that I did as part of my PhD. Um, this was under organic conditions, but um, applied to a, a, a forage crop that you would find on, on all kinds of different uh, farms. So it was an existing alfalfa grass stand up near Lebo, Manitoba, a high soil pH. We were using granular struvites, so if you'll remember, those are the conditions where struvite solubility should be really challenging. So we were really trying to put this th stuff through its paces. Uh, very low Olson P at that site though. And what we did is went in in spring of 2017 to this established stand, uh, drilled in struvite in a one-time application, spring of 2017, and then monitored over three years. So again, to get at that, you know, that long-term pattern. And what we see, you know, we had three different rates, as you can see on the x-axis of this graph, um, the recommended rate, and then double and three times. And these regression lines here are for the three different years of the study. And what you'll notice is, so even, so the blue line is 2017, the first year. Even in that first year, we had a significant response to the struvite, um, but only really at those higher rates. But as the years went by, so in 2018, we've got a steeper slope. The strength of the response to struvite uh, application rate was actually increasing with time. So we had, we did see some more evidence of that long-term uh, phosphorus supply in this field study on those, under those really challenging conditions. When we looked at that forage biomass in the final year and separated out into its components, uh, we saw that it was really the, only the alfalfa that was responding to the struvite. And this is not unique to struvite. This will happen, I think, with probably other fertil uh, phosphate fertilizers too. Um, but it does speak uh, to the importance of, of phosphorus nutrition for those forages, not only for the forage quantity, uh, you see we're more than tripling the forage yield in that um, third year uh, over the, the unfertilized control, but also the forage quality in terms of um, protein and, and that sort of thing, as well as nitrogen fixation that you can expect from that alfalfa forage stand. At that same site, I did field studies, I won't go into the details, and did find a significant yield increase with wheat as well. Not a dramatic one, but it was there. Um, whoops, wrong slide. Uh, wrong little box, sorry, phosphorus, uh, forage phos uh, phosphorus concentration in the plant tissue also increased in the, um, in the, uh, the, the treatments that had struvite applied to them. So again, a forage quality um, thing. I'll get to that other thing about the wheat and flax in a minute. So this, in this study, I didn't actually include a soluble fertilizer for comparison in the field, but in a pot experiment that I did using the same soil plus another one, uh, compared struvite and monoammonium phosphate with, uh, uh, on alfalfa and saw no difference in the crop biomass or phosphorus uptake. So that again is promising in uh, that, you know, at least uh, these alfalfa forages seem to um, respond equally well to, to struvite as to a soluble uh, phosphorus fertilizer. I wanted to look at some other um, indicators, though, of what's happening with the phosphorus dynamics in these systems. So, as we know, phosphate fertilizers tend to suppress mycorrhizal fungi. And so, uh, what I did is I looked at the, the alfalfa root colonization with mycorrhizal fungi in, this is the second year of that three-year study, so it's a full year and a bit after application, and found no effect on um, mycorrhizal fungi. So that's also promising. And that's not kind of overwhelming that, uh, that plant symbiosis with the fungi. Um, also interested to know what's happening to the baseline Olson P in that study due to the application of this stuff. And so as you can see, we had sort of this trend towards increasing Olson P. It wasn't significant at the 0 0.05 uh, level, but, but getting kind of close. Um, but still below 10 ppm Olson P. But still to raise uh, Olson P up to about 9 from 3 uh, is 
you know, can be a, a valuable um, result of, of applying this uh, struvite. Here we go, the wheat. Wheat, we had a uh, yield response, not uh, huge, but it was significant. Flax, no yield response, which isn't um, entirely surprising. So that's all at one site. So that's one little piece of the puzzle. Um, I also want to talk briefly about another site. Um, Dr. Henry Wilson from Ag Canada is running this um, in western Manitoba. Uh, it's a paired watershed study where they can look at the productivity of the alfalfa uh, forage as well as the risk of phosphorus losses. So um, again, um, we see sort of that long-term effect of the struvite application, although a little less so in this case um, in the early years. So struvite was applied in May of 2019. Struvite is blue, an unfertilized control is the orange. And so the first couple years, not much response. Those were some droughty years though. But by 2022, there's a pretty um, significant uh, effect on the, the forage yield. Um, in the runoff part of that, the results of that are still kind of being put together, but it, what it looks like so far is that um, there was no increase in the dissolved phosphorus loss due to the struvite application compared to an unfertilized control. So you can imagine in this unfertilized control there would be pretty s insignificant uh, phosphorus losses and we're seeing the same thing on the struvite side of that um, paired watershed. Now this is uh, where things get quite interesting, I think, um, looking at how Olson P fits into that whole picture um, in terms of the risk of phosphorus loss. So the Olson P in the surface soil, zero to five centimeters, is a really good indicator of the risk of phosphorus loss, and that's what they found in a whole bunch of studies uh, across Manitoba, Saskatchewan. And uh, so that's kind of you know, what you look for. If you see higher Olson P, you expect to see higher risks of losses. And if you look at this chart, again, the blue line is the struvite treatments, and the orange uh, and gray are some unfertilized control uh, watersheds in, in this uh, little study area. And just in, in the last part of this graph, uh, you can see the struvite was applied here in uh, 2019. After that, the Olson P in the struvite treatment does start shooting up, and it's actually really high, like concerningly high, uh, or getting there anyway, by 2020. And yet, we didn't see that increased phosphorus loss. So these are preliminary results. Um, we don't want to draw any broad conclusions on this yet, but it makes us ask whether perhaps struvite can increase that Olson P, uh, the plant, you know, that indicator of how, how the plants may respond to phosphorus uh, without increasing that phosphorus risk loss. Lots of more research required there, though. The other thing that plays into this then, though, is that this stuff really does take a long time to dissolve, and we have seen in the year after application these sort of remnants of granules uh, still visible in the soil. Um, so, you know, that does help explain that multi-year phosphorus supply thing. There's still lots of questions about how it's reacting with the soil, and, you know, is it better or worse than than, uh, say, a soluble fertilizer that immediately react, reacts with the soil and then is released from uh, the different forms, uh, reaction products. But it also raises a bunch of questions about what happens if you get one of those granules in your two grams of soil that you're running your soil test on. Uh, there's one paper that I know of that has looked at this so far, and um, they say in their conclusions that the residual struvite dissolution in a soil test can overestimate soil test phosphorus concentrations by 20 to 3,900 percent. That's 39 times what your, what your soil test phosphorus should be. So that, clearly that is problematic. Um, so I'm in the process actually of applying for some funding to look at this a little more under Manitoba conditions and uh, hope to unravel that a little more. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about um, long-term strategies for, uh, for applying this fertilizer and how to use it. So when I had that wheat crop that had sort of a moderate response to, to phosphorus, I wondered if you applied it, um, that struvite to a crop in the year before, a, a crop that it would be expected to really, you know, be able to dissolve it, bring it into the biologically active pool, would that help out the wheat in the following year compared to just applying struvite directly to wheat. So I looked at a few different um, green manure cover crops. 
uh, at a couple sites, uh, LIBO again, and near Treehern, Manitoba. I'm just going to show the LIBO data right now. Uh, so in year one, 2020, we grew buckwheat, peas, and fava beans as green manures. And actually, the only case where any of those responded to any kind of phosphorus fertilizer significantly was with buckwheat at LIBO. And there, the, the struvite, which is the green, and the map, which was the orange, were, um, were uh, similar statistically and were greater than the control. As you can see in this photo, too, um, the unfertilized buckwheat really did not thrive at all. Um, and not much response from those other two. But then when uh, we grew the wheat in the following year, uh, we thought that maybe applying the struvite in the year before would be beneficial, and it wasn't. It made no difference. So um, it, it demonstrates that, that, you know, you don't need to be too strategic, probably, with the, stru the struvite application. Apply it where, where, the, where the, you expect a crop to respond to a phosphorus fertilizer. Um, this uh, master student, Manushi, also did a pot study looking at, you know, at that, um, the effect of extra time in the soil. You know, if we apply the struvite a little early, does it react with the soil, start dissolving a bit, maybe increase the, the phosphorus supply to a plant? And she actually found the opposite. If you apply it early with no plants there, uh, it seems that it starts to dissolve, react with the soil, and actually reduce the phosphorus supply to the plant. So again, this is one small study, but it does seem that um, probably applying that struvite directly to a plant um, at time of seeding is perhaps uh, the best timing um, option. What time have we got here? I'm going to whip through a couple of these real fast just to show some of the other research that's been done on uh, blending struvite with soluble fertilizers. Like since that's how um, Austera is, is recommending it uh, for conventional growers. For the organic um, growers who are hoping to use this, once, uh, once it hopefully becomes added, they'd be looking at using uh, struvite uh, alone. But most uh, conventional growers would probably be using it in a blend. So this is corn grain yield. This is done in, at, um, in Ontario, um, Kim Schneider's lab there. Uh, they looked at crystal green alone or MAP alone and a blend of 25% struvite or crystal green with 75% MAP. And so in one year, you know, that blend was the highest yielding. In the, uh, the other year, the struvite alone was the highest yielding, but definitely no penalty to using struvite and, um, and that blend may be a good way to go. They, um, they also, I won't show you the data right now, but you can ask me about it later if you want. They also found, not too surprisingly, you know, the, the soil Olsen pea and the soluble reactive pea, so again, that phosphorus that's really at risk of losses, uh, was lower for struvite than for MAP, and for blends it was in between. No big surprises there. Potato work in Eastern Canada, again, found uh, that the blends uh, worked really well. Um, and actually that struvite used alone worked really well in all sites except for one. But these were acidic soils, so again, could contribute uh, to um, greater stru struvite dissolution. They also suggest that maybe under cold or phosphorus depleted uh, conditions that um, you might not see such a, such a good um, effect from the, those blends. And a pot study in Illinois, I thought this was kind of interesting because they show, here's the blends you know, for corn on the left, soybean on the right. This is the, the biomass of these plants, you know, with blends uh, increasing with more struvite as you move to the right within each crop. So you can see this sort of decline uh, with, when adding more struvite. But um, first of all, you know, the patterns for the two different crops were a little different in terms of when that decline started. Um, but then, uh, I didn't show the data, but they found no actual difference in phosphorus uptake. So there's a biomass effect there, but no phosphorus uptake. Um, and, and so perhaps something else is, is uh, controlling that, that biomass. And they didn't measure yield, so there's, again, lots more work that could be done there. So just to summarize a little bit what we know about struvite as a fertilizer, um, I should have bolded this part. Struvite can be an effective phosphorus source, but it seems to really depend on the conditions. And where it did work really well, we demonstrated it at one site for a few years, is in an established forage stand. I suspect, I speculate, that it may have to do with that existing root system that was there and um, ready to start acting on that struvite. 
We needed high rates, though, when we were using the struvite um, as a sole uh, fertilizer. But it does seem to provide that multi-year supply. Risk of losses, again, lots of questions there, and uh, the effects on soil tests are, are concerning, um, but require a lot more research. In terms of the blends, again, uh, lots of questions. I've heard mixed results from farmers who are using blends, and so, um, Again, I wouldn't, uh, you know, I would say just be careful when you're trying this out uh, or recommending this to people. And in terms of optimum management, we still have way more questions than answers. So, um, you know, we can kind of start with, with uh, some assumptions of what we know based on, on how this stuff behaves theoretically and go from there, but there's still a lot more testing required. Now, I just want to throw this in terms, into this sort of big picture idea into this uh, when we think about phosphorus recycling in Canada, uh, just some numbers that I pulled out of this paper that was um, written by Jess Nixie and Martin Entz, uh, looking at the potential for this. And so, you know, Canada imports a lot of phosphorus fertilizers. We also import some phosphate uh, in ag products. We import way more than we export. Um, but the human phosphorus that's generated, that's like in our actual excreta plus food waste and stuff, is actually more or less equal to what we import as egg products and is um, about uh, if we could recycle that perfectly back to agricultural land, that could replace 8% uh, of the imported fertilizer that we use. So that's clearly not everything and not even a huge amount of it compared to like the EU where they could replace uh, more than 50% of their phosphorus needs just by recycling their human uh, phosphorus. But I'm a big believer in every bit counts and taking those uh, steps towards, um, you know, increasing the sustainability of these uh, systems in whatever way we can. So thanks for your attention. I went through that all real fast, but I would welcome any comments or questions that you have on any of that I can discuss further. Also your ideas for uh, how you see farmers using this um, that would feed into some research questions that we can hopefully um, answer here. Thanks. Well, Mission accomplished, Joanne. I'm told there are lots of questions. I so. only have 10 so far. Are you ready? Rapid fire. Step up, step up to the mic. Let's go. Anybody here want one? Okay, so while you're checking, uh, I think one of the key ones that's been brought up is in the forage stand, how was the struvite applied? Like, how did you get it in there? And then... Um, Sorry, I, they keep coming in. I have to keep going here. So, okay, so... Um, how was it applied? Was it a surface application? Let's start there. Okay, so the struvite was banded beneath the surface. It was with our double disc plot drill. Uh, so it does need to get down into the surface. We did a little side thing where we tried just uh, surface applying it with a forage stand. And then it rained for a couple weeks and went back and there it is still just sitting on the surface. So uh, it, was, it was only after that area got tilled that you could start seeing that struvite start working. So yeah, you do need to get it down into the soil um, for it to be effective. Uh, opportunity for it to be used seed placed as a starter fertilizer. Yes, I think seed placed is probably the way to go. That's based on only a very small amount of research. As I said, there's been like very little uh, research on, on alternative placements, but it does seem to work well seed placed. Hang on, Tammy. Don't think that the online people get to ask all the questions. Uh, I'm going to do one more, no. though, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so salt index, uh, compared to 1152, how slow is the release, and does the magnesium increase the pH in the high pH soils? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, it is released a lot more slowly than 1152. Uh, we did a little study in petri dishes with a high school student actually for a science fair project. We put a, a granule in the middle of a petri dish and left it for 28 days and then sampled the soil in concentric rings around that dish. And um, yeah, the, we pulled the struvite granule out of that, um, you know, that was still sitting there so that we could see how much actually made it into the soil out of the, the granule. And yeah, it was... It was orders of magnitude smaller for struvite than for MAP. Um, yeah, 
And the other question is about the magnesium, and I'm sorry, I can't really answer that. Maybe Don wants to take that one. He's shaking his head. No, I don't think any of us really know that much about the magnesium dynamics. Yeah. Yeah, okay, it, with, with it um, thinking about organic applications um, and this being extraction from human st streams, can you comment on um, any contamination risks, like that aspect? For, yeah, for I can comment. It's, um, there's very little, okay, so the main concerns with contamination with human sourced uh, Nutrients are um, metals and so that kind of thing in, that you find in, in municipal waste. And biological contaminants like pathogens, antimicrobial resistance genes, those kinds of things. In terms of the metals, the struvite produced by this process that Ostera uses is very low. Way lower actually than in MAP or any of these other, um, um, you know, kind of mainstream uh, fertilizers. The biological contaminants also seems to be quite low. There are a couple of studies. There was one done that showed that, uh, you know, there was some risk that there, there could be some of these biological contaminants that come with the struvite. But uh, I've literally seen two published studies on that. So lots and lots of questions about that still. Um, but, the, but I'll just say that the EU has already provisionally approved struvite from like this process, the Ostera process, for use in organic. They're just kind of working out some of the details of the regulation. So it will be approved for use in organic there. Um, and I expect, I hope at least, that Canada will follow.